And with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Liz Keith at ProBonerNet. Great. Thank you so much, Jillian. And thank you again, Sart, and welcome again uh, to everyone joining us today. I'm Liz Keith. I'm the program director at ProBonerNet, and we are a national nonprofit that's celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. And we work to bring the power of the law to all by building cutting edge digital tools for advocates, volunteers, and the public, and by strengthening collaboration in the civil justice sector. And I'm really uh, thrilled to be joined today by three women who have been leading really innovative and interesting work in, uh, at the intersection of civil legal aid and victims of crime and technology. Kiskeya Addison and Rochelle Hahn have both been spearheading statewide legal aid technology initiatives in their own state justice communities and are now also deeply involved with projects that are funded by the Office of Victims of Crime or state VOCA funders that are leveraging technology to increase access to civil legal aid for victims of crime such as domestic violence, elder abuse, or financial exploitation. And um, also delighted to welcome Meg Garvin, the director of the National Crime Victim Law Institute, a leading national organization working on victim advocacy, training and education and public policy. And if you're not familiar with NCVLI, they have deep expertise and linkages in the victim rights and victim services space and are um, an organization you should know about. And hopefully today we'll uh, provide a, a welcome and overview to NCVLI's work and uh, their involvement in technology initiatives in this space. So for uh, the next uh, 50 minutes or so, we are going to first hear from Kiskeya and Rochelle, who are going to talk, take us through uh, some technology and collaboration and staffing models that are being used in New York State and Massachusetts to increase access to legal assistance for victims of crime and that have intersections with and uh, collaborate with existing legal aid programs or legal aid technology innovations. And we'll hear a bit about the anatomy of these efforts and how these partnerships were formed and funded. And then we'll turn it over to Meg, who will provide a kind of zoom out and provide a, ver a bird's eye view of, I think, some of the, the vision and exciting work uh, driving, driving these efforts in the victim services arena and NCVLI's work uh, in more than half a dozen states on technology re related initiatives. Um, and then we'll close with sharing some resources for all of you to helpfully, hopefully help you identify partners uh, in your local communities or funding resources or um, other resources to help advance conversations you may already be ha having or wanting to have in your own communities on these efforts. So uh, we'll spotlight some really excellent resources developed by the Justice and Government Project at American University, NLADA, uh, and a few, organization few other organizations at the end of this. Um, and I'll just close by, by saying that Pro BonoNet has had an opportunity to partner on several of the initiatives that we'll touch on today and are generally hearing a lot from, our, from the legal aid community uh, and legal aid techies who are thinking about how to either develop new or embed existing legal aid technology innovations in victim serving initiatives. So um, again, we hope the approaches and resources that we're sharing here will help inform and support the conversations you, you may be having in your own communities. Uh, and we will pause at the end of each segment to take questions and uh, 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 share additional resources. So as Jillian and Sart mentioned, we do really want to hear your, your questions and thoughts as we go. So please uh, keep those coming in the Q&A box. Great. Um, so I'll turn it over to Kiskea. Thank you, Liz. Uh, again, my name is Kiskea Addison. I'm program director for Law Help New York. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the New York Crime Victims Legal Network, the project vision, some key aspects of the tech strategy, and then some next steps for the future as we're embarking on a new project with new funding for the program. Now, just a little bit of historical background. The network was developed in 2014 through funding from the Department of Justice, Office of Victims of Crime. We are one of 10 OVC-funded legal network projects. What's really exciting 
exciting and unique about our project is that we were able to take the time of over 18 months to really develop a needs assessment to really get at what were some of the needs of the communities that we were trying to serve, who were the communities, and do some user testing, surveys, focus groups, and that gave us time to also then start iterating and creating and refining some of the, our assumptions. So this is a model that I wish that I could do for all of my projects that I'm working on with Law Help New York, and I think that it, it's a good model for um, other programs. Go to the next one, Liz. So this just talks a little bit about the project. So it's a partnership of organizations working together to address civil legal needs and talks a little bit about our vision. The vision of the network uh, was to connect victims of crime to a variety of services. And we want to use a variety of different tools and mechanisms. The website is one part of the network, but there are a lot of different tools that we branch out to and a lot of things that we're trying to try out through this network to try to ensure that there are better services to victims of crime and also to support the, the organizations that are serving them. You can go to the next one, Liz. Okay, I just want to talk a little bit about the technology strategy. This is one of the most tech-centered projects out of the 10. Uh, it's a project where uh, ProvotoNet, a tech partner, was brought in on the onset of the project. Many times after a program has already decided what they want to do, they bring in technology and tech expertise. But we were brought in at the beginning of the project, which really helped to, on the onset of the project to have program and tech inform one another's work. And I think that is a key to uh, the continuation of the project. So we tried to collaborate as project partners partners and each partner has a very unique role and goal. So we have Center for Human Ser Research, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later, and the content support from the Empire Justice Center. And we were able to design and prototype uh, and build out the website, a triage tool, a directory, and an advocate gateway that we're continuing to build on. What's really exciting about this project is we were able to leverage over 20 years of partnership that Law Help New York has built since its founding um, where we had partners and advisory committee that was a very strong advisory committee that helped us build up a referral directory that was a pretty comprehensive referral directory with 300 different organizations and about three 600 different listings because organizations have multiple listings. So we were able to ensure that the information was reliable, trustworthy, and that partners would update their information through one source as opposed to trying to have multiple directories and multiple websites. So we're continuing to build that out uh, through data mapping and building up the ro a robust API so that hopefully this referral directory information can be leveraged for other sites as well in New York State because we really want to build up this sort of referral ecosystem and content ecosystem across the state. Additionally, um, we built uh, we used Live Help, which Live Help launched 10 years ago through funding from uh, Legal Services Corporation. And what we've done is we've offered training, which I'll talk about a little bit later, for our volunteers to offer chat assistance through the Crime Victim Legal Network. Thanks, Liz. Next one. And this is just to show you the variety of the partners that are working on this project. And for me, the most important part of this project is that it's a, it's a collaborative effort of a variety of different sectors. We have technology, we have government, we have legal aid, we have a statewide uh, legal services provider, and we also have University of Albany Center for Human Services Research, so uh, um, academics. So what's really, it, each offers different perspectives, expertise, and I think there's just a mutual respect of what each partner offers to the collaboration. I really believe in this kind of model because we were able to have partners that can help us understand the needs of the, of the participants, collect the data that we needed, understand the different technology options that were available, and understand the, the community that's uh, at risk, that's the community that we're trying to serve. Can, the next one. So this is just an example. I'm just going to show a couple of examples of key features of the site so that I don't go into the site and spend a lot of the time going through it. But this is uh, what the Know Your Rights section, if you click on the Know Your Rights um, button on the top of the website, you'll see. And you'll see that there are eight topic areas with civil legal information. And this is information that was sourced through that needs assessment period where we figured out these are the areas of most importance. And within each of these areas, there is additional information about resources and it's on-site content, on-site information for people to be able to access it, read it, and understand it. And the hope is that they'll understand it and also be able to take action to deal with the legal issue or find a service provider that can assist them. Next one. 
Um, and then also through this site, we've created a triage tool that helps get people to resources that would be suggested for them, depending on what their search is, what information they put into um, the tool. So you'll see here it has results for Erie County and child support, and it has common legal questions for those areas. Um, and then there's additional information below for providers that can assist them. So instead of having people just go out to either getting the resources or the provider in one place, they can find both so that it's a seamless experience where they can get the services information that they need. Okay, next one. Uh, here are two key, key features of the site as well. Um, you'll see here the legal directory that was sourced through Law Help New York. We are trying to, a, a warm referral mechanism, at least for the last eight years since I've been involved with Legal Aid, Legal Services, and Law Help, we've thought about, okay, how do we enable warm referral mechanisms? How do we get people to the right service providers that have capacity to deal with their specific legal issue so that people aren't going around in circles trying to find assistance? So you'll see here on this slide on the left side, there's a check mark and it says try this first, and those are warm referral partners, and they are partners who are receiving OBC funding, and they are um, going, they have agreed to, well, they are funded to assist pe victims of crime. So there are a couple of mechanisms that people can get through to them. There's either a phone line that's just for people to call in or a, potentially an email, and then the provider will respond to them within uh, two days. And so we're trying to find different ways to do that, but you'll see at the bottom, one organization is not specifically directly funded, and they aren't a referral partner for this, so we are hoping that people will first reach out to the referral partners. This is, we're testing this, and we're iterating, we're seeing what's the best model to use, and we really do wanna see, after this has been rolled out for a while, how this is working, and give some suggestions, because I know this is an area of, of importance for a lot of people in the community. And then you'll see through um, the Crime Victim Legal Network, well, we try to leverage court forms that are available through Law Help Interactive that are available on Law Help New York. And so this was a way we wanted to try to, to as I was talking about earlier, this ecosystem, we don't want any information to just exist in silos. We want to make sure that it can be leveraged and used and accessed and accessed appropriately for people who are in need. So you can find court help information, you can find directory information and live help that were sourced through Law Help New York. You can also find other resources and tools that, have built, that were built specifically on the Crime Victim Legal Help website. So here are the uh, legal forms that are available through Law Help New York. Thanks, Liz. And what, a really exciting aspect of this project, which I think has been really helpful for the law student and also legal community of uh, pro bono lawyers in New York State, is that we were able to build out a training with Empire Justice Center, Law Help New York, Pro Bono Net, to offer assistance to live help volunteers who are law students, law grads, who are offering live chat assistance on Law Help New York or the Crime Victim Legal Network website. And they, we really wanted to focus in on trauma-informed care and support because we want them to think about how this is affecting them, how this is affecting the other person, and we want to sort of build in empathy into the practice. So we think that this is going to be helpful and useful for the individual who's in need, who's looking for assistance through the through live help, and also to the legal community, sort of building this idea of empathy within the legal community. Okay, next one. Uh, here you'll just see from Project Launch. So the project launched in October 2018 just in three counties. And just over the summer, we expanded to 57 counties in New York State. So you'll see here views for the help directory search. So help directory searches, access to know your rights information, and also users to the site. And we believe it's going to continue to grow now that we are in uh, 57 of the 62 counties in New York State. Okay, next one. Uh, so our vision for the future, now we're moving on from uh, the previous funding to, to have VOCA funding, and we're looking at this as a, an a opportunity to assess the project, a vision for the future, and how do we integrate some of these technology innovations but into a service model that helps facilitate the work of providers that are on the ground who are either who are social workers, who are legal aid attorneys, who are paralegals, who are assisting victims of crime and have received uh, funding through VOCA. It's a great opportunity because um, they received this VOCA funding, so they are uh, um, focused on this area, on supporting individuals who are victims of crime. So we're really excited. So we're able to think about how do we do this, how do we integrate more support into the service model, and also we're able to expand the team. We're going to have two coordinating attorneys that are Empire Justice Center attorneys who are going to be across the state. They're going to be understanding how the network works and how to leverage it to support other providers across the state. We're also going to be bringing on a technology innovations manager for how do we integrate these different tools in a, just a seamless way to improve the experience. 
in next one, Liz. And this is just looking at sort of the big picture of what we're doing in our expansion. So we're continuing to work on building out website features, uh, thinking of new issue areas, thinking about partnership in a broader range, not just sort of legal aid providers, but also some of the other service community, building out geography, and trying to build capacity. Uh, can you do the next one? It should be the last. Oh, this is the last one. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to say, uh, I'm glad I was on time. Okay. So what we're really just excited about is really moving on and being able to support uh, direct services attorneys across the New York State and making sure this is an ecosystem for the, the whole community. That's about it. Great. Thank you, Kiskeya. Um, I, I wondered if you could just say a, a few words, a few more words about the Advocate Gateway concept. Oh, yes. I was trying to rush uh, through. Thank you, Liz. It, just how that, how that relates to the idea of supporting this community of direct service providers and uh, victim-serving attorneys that, that OVS in New York State is, is funding in addition to the technology strategy. Yes, we are very excited to be able to build out this service, this practice area. It's going to be existing on the Crime Victim Legal Network, on where people will be able to access it. it will be password protected. But we're hoping it's going to be a sort of a communication channel for providers who are on the ground assisting individuals who are victims of crime, where they could share resources, information, trainings, tools, have methods for communication, share um, events, and that really we can build that out. And what's been great about the idea of the expanded capacity is we're going to be able to bring on some who's going to take on building the content in that site and collecting that content from the service community. And it's really amazing because we have a wonderful CVLN advisory committee that is embedded and they can share that this research information. So we're going to continue to build that out to be a resource and a service for the community. Great. Uh, thank you. And then there's a, a question from Duncan, a really excellent question that uh, I think a lot of groups in this webinar probably have grappled with, which is how did uh, this project organize or initiate focus groups and community outreach? Um, you know, how did we find venues to test the, the prototype and get feedback on the project? Um, and um, Kiske, I can help. Uh, that would be helpful. Yes. <laughs> so I think um, I was involved in, in some of that in, uh, in the first sort of 18 months or, or two years. And we were, as Kiske has said, very fortunate to have an academic research partner who helped organize that and was uh, funded to do so under the, the, the uh, Victim Legal Network project funding. Um, but it, frankly, it took a lot of work and a lot of time to pull together groups of six or eight people um, essentially at public libraries and social service agencies in the pilot region of Western New York. And then we augmented that by recruiting a group of about 10 or 12 representatives from the victim community who had connections with our, our partner network and our advisory committee to essentially serve as an insight group and feedback group for us. And we uh, emailed them periodically over time with new prototypes or new screens, li very lightweight surveys to get their feedback, sort of A-B testing. Um, but the, the, the challenge of, of um, getting, getting critical mass for focus groups, uh, that, that, was a, that was a challenge at times. Great. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Kiskeya. And we will turn it over to Rochelle. And uh, please keep the, the questions coming. And um, we'll uh, now move to, to Massachusetts and uh, hear from Michelle about the Massachusetts, Massachusetts uh, uh, Civil Legal Aid for Victims of Crime Initiative. Thank you, Liz. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so as I said, my name is Rochelle Hahn, and I, along with Jamie Sabino, co-manage the CLAVIC initiative in Massachusetts. So CLAVIC stands for Civil Legal Aid for Victims of Crime. We started in July 2017 when MLAC, the primary IALTA funder in Massachusetts, was awarded an $8.3 million two-year grant to create a statewide legal aid collaboration to provide civil legal aid to victims of crime. For more background about how the initiative came, the overall initiative came about, there's a link on the screen there. Uh, there's a case study that was written about us that's posted on the Justice and Government Toolkit. But briefly, we had this opportunity. It was a result of a confluence of factors, additional VOCA funding becoming available, expanded local rules on how you could use this kind of funding for legal assistance for crime victims, and also our state. Um, that the Massachusetts Office for Victim Assistance had done a study 
that showed one of the largest unmet needs for crime victims was legal assistance. So when additional funding became available, they were very interested in helping to um, facilitate legal services. So our project actually focuses primarily on providing direct service to clients. Um, that was what our state was uh, local funder was very interested in. Our Clavic attorneys um, help with a wide range of civil legal matters that um, range from divorce, evictions, wage theft, immigration matters, identity theft, and, and much more. The, the key is that there has to be a nexus between the civil legal need the person's experiencing and the crime. And in the first 18 months of the project, uh, we opened more than 2,100 cases. And of course, there's been more since then, lots more. Next slide. So right from the start, the, it was envisioned that CLAVIC would be a coordinated and comprehensive uh, program. Uh, it was decided that we didn't want to have a lot of individual um, programs applying for funding, because then you'd have one lawyer you know, in a domestic violence shelter and maybe another lawyer in a homicide bereavement group or half a lawyer. And it could be very, very isolating for people. So instead, the, our project um, uh, is a more comprehensive project, and it really leverages resources by tapping into the very robust legal services system that already exists in Massachusetts. So the project funds about 26 to 28 CLAVIC attorneys. Do, that's the direct service part of it. And they were embedded into nine existing legal services programs. Six of them are regional programs, plus three more programs that do statewide work. And then my office helps manage the program. Um, so as I mentioned, this, this is enabling CLAVIC to leverage the existing legal services resources. And it's also been wonderful for legal services because we are the legal services programs are benefiting from the new resources, you know, the people power in particular but also all the training and materials development and the outreach and the new connections and partnerships that are being developed as a result of CLAVIC. Because as every legal services pr program on the call knows, you know, so many of our clients are victims of crime and trauma and um, everyone in legal aid, every legal aid lawyer can really benefit from the support that we're developing for CLAVIC attorneys. Also, um, what's been particularly important has been uh, intake is also integrated into the existing legal services program. So we do have a particular specific CLAVIC intake venues, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But I think it's really important that intake is also coming through the local legal aid programs through our existing venue channels like call centers, clinics, lawyer for the day programs. Because we find that a lot of clients who are actually eligible for CLAVIC services don't necessarily identify top of mind as being a victim of crime. Often they're thinking about the legal problem that they have, not necessarily saying, oh, this is, I wouldn't have this problem but for the crime that I experienced two years ago. So I think it's been really important that our intake staff overall has been trained to identify CLAVIC, potential CLAVIC cases. So this approach, this integration approach, also applied to our approach to technology. Massachusetts has a robust websites project. We oversee several existing websites and also do work on other tech projects. So for CLAVIC purposes, we did add a new program website, but we also did enhance our existing um, CLAVIC websites. And again, the advantage to this is that everyone in legal services is benefiting from, from CLAVIC, and the CLAVIC attorneys are also benefiting from the strong existing websites. But let me talk for a few minutes about uh, the program website that we did build. Next slide. Oops. Yep. Uh, slide before that. All right. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is the, the top half of the homepage for massclavic.org. This is a fairly straightforward website. Um, we built it in WordPress. Our other websites are Drupal websites because they're much bigger. Uh, this is kind of, we needed to build this fast. And um, so we did this lightweight uh, Word, uh, WordPress site to be the face of the project. And we use this for outreach, marketing, communications. I'd like to give a shout out to Illinois Legal Aid Online. Uh, we use their site for some of our inspiration. So this is the top half of the homepage. Next slide. 
Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yeah. And there's the, the bottom half of that. You'll notice we have stories on the website, and that was something that Illinois has done as well. And, um, you know, this concept of the nexus between your legal problem and the crime can be a little bit confusing for everybody. So we're hoping that through these different stories, it'll give people a sense and of what we're talking about. Next slide. So some of the key elements of the Clavic website, um, probably first and foremost, is um, a legal help finder tool. Um, for Clavic, the only demographic criteria is that you live in Massachusetts, your legal problem be in Massachusetts. There's no financial eligibility requirements. There's no immigration requirements. So what we do through our legal help finder tool on the Clavic website, we just ask people to enter their zip code and um, what comes up are the regional programs that might support, they can get help from, or the statewide programs. The statewide programs focus on specific substantive areas. So, um, and it has the contact information, if there is an online intake capacity, that button is right there, or else um, there's always a telephone call. And Clavic also comes up as an, as an entry on our existing statewide legal resource finder. And again, that's helpful because there's a lot of people that are going to be eligible for Clavic that aren't identifying, self-identifying as being a victim of crime. Next, next page. We also have a page on the website specifically for service providers. And um, we do a lot of outreach to service providers and those who work with victims of crime. And this page is for them. One of the most useful features for them on this page is our referral. You see in green, it says make a referral to Clavic. If you click on that link, it brings you to a very simple WUFU form page, which gathers basic information about the person and their contact information, whether it's safe to contact them at the various, at their contact number, um, and a, place for a brief description of the problem. The referrer chooses from a list of the programs which program they want to make the referral to. On the program side, once that the, a, a contact in the program is notified that a referral has been submitted, and then they do an intake and, and get back to the client. There's also a box that the referrer can check if, to give permission to do re-referrals which most people do. So for example, if a referral go, comes into a, 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 one of the Clavic programs and they're full up, but they know that another program might have capacity, they could go ahead and just re-refer it without having to you know, get the client or the, refer, or the social service provider involved. Um, programs, uh, the referrers have really you know, enjoy, you know, used this a lot. There's been over 250 uh, referrals coming in through this form. It's an easy way for programs to contact Clavic. Next slide. We do have legal information on the Clavic website. Uh, what we have done is we primarily link back to our existing statewide websites, Mass Legal Help and Mass Legal Services, or other trusted state resources. We are amplify using Clavic funding to help amplify some of these resources on our existing websites. Um, but we tend to put the information on the existing websites and then link from Clavic. Next slide. Next slide. And then another element is social service resources. You know, that's another key need for survivors of crime. However, our state, uh, the Mass Office for Victim Services, already had a website, which is a, a search tool for these resources called Ask Mova. So we prominently link back to this site rather than trying to start our own. And we are also listed as an entry um, in their Ask MOVA website. Next slide. So another thing we've been doing with Clavic um, is this advocate portal, or it's really an attorney portal for the most part. Um, so we are using our statewide website, Mass Legal Services, to support um, our Clavic attorneys. We already had that. We have a. We already have that built into our website. We have spaces for different groups and practice areas. And so we created one for Clavic. And what you can get through this Clavic workspace is there's an email list, and all the emails are archived, which has been great because um, 
you know, people come and go, and, and new staff can, can get caught up on, on past things that have gone through the archives very easily. This space is also used for our calendar of events. We have a very robust training program. We have about nine specific Clavic trainings a year. Some of them are in person. Some of them are online. And um, those materials are publicized through the site. And also, we, um, we will record trainings and, and post them to the website. We also, um, and then there's also, and then there's also just other means to try to keep our Clavic advocates connected. You know, they're all in different legal. They're, as I mentioned, they're in nine different programs, but we're trying to create an identi a Clavic identity as well. Next slide. Next page. Sorry, next slide. <laughs> yeah, and we are providing additional web resources for our Clavic attorneys, which will also benefit the legal services attorneys. And here's just a few examples. Um, we also are trying to do more on trauma-informed representation. So, for example, we had a really wonderful training that was presented by a social worker on how trauma impacts the brain and how this, in turn, affects how your client interacts with you or with the legal system. So this is a training that we were co recorded and posted, and it's available not only to Clavic attorneys but to all our legal services attorneys. We've developed substantive mini guides on different law topics. We've developed larger legal guides for victims of crime and providers. We have other practice aids, such as checklists. Many of our Clavic attorneys are generalists or practice in more than one substantive area, but um, we're trying to encourage people to view Clavic, uh, view our clients holistically, so we're trying to help people to learn to issue spot and then make internal referrals. And again, on our existing advocate website, we have a very extensive library, and a lot of these materials are getting posted to that library for the benefit of Clavic attorneys and other legal services attorneys. And similarly, the Clavic attorneys are able to use the existing comprehensive resources. Next slide. So next steps on the tech front, I mean, thankfully, we have been approved uh, for another two years. So um, some of the activities we're contemplating uh, doing are we're hoping to develop an online interactive training for attorneys assisting domestic violence survivors to get restraining orders. Um, and this would be a training that we develop specifically for an online training. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a recorded in-person training. We are in the middle of a TIG project to enhance our existing legal resource finder, our statewide triage tool, and we're hoping to upgrade that to more directly assist victims of crime. And we're also exploring using various interactive checklists and guides using tools such as DocAssemble to to help on that. And some lessons learned, I think similar to what um, Kaseya talked about in New York, um, you know, I think you have to roll our tech projects to think about sustainability and whether you can maintain the things that you create and how you can continue to leverage the existing resources and not duplicate work. Um, and another project, another thing that I think is really important is to not forget about outreach. I think outreach is really critical, particularly to providers who work with victims of crime, and also outreach to our own Clavic advocates. To, you know, we develop all these great resources for them, but you have to keep reminding people that they're there. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rochelle. That was a great overview, and uh, I hope for the attendees in the webinar who are managing or involved in legal aid technology initiatives, both Rochelle's overview and Kiskea's have sparked some ideas for how uh, the resources that you manage or develop might support um, or be embedded in or kind of build linkages to these victim services initiatives, and uh, uh, really exciting to, to hear both about the, the work that's happening in Massachusetts and New York. So um, I'm not seeing any uh, any questions at the moment, but please uh, keep those coming as we, we go. So we're going to, but we'll have time at the end to come back uh, to those. But we're going to now zoom to the West Coast and Meg uh, Garvin joining us from the National Crime Victim Law Institute to uh, zoom out and give us a, a bit more of the bird's eye view of some of the vision of this that's driving this work and NCVLI's um, involvement in a number of initiatives uh, across the country that may intersect with programs that uh, uh, efforts that are happening in your state justice community. So uh, Meg, uh, welcome. 
Great. Thanks, Liz. And it has been exciting just being another um, presenter or panelist on this webinar. I, I already knew some of each of the two programs that were just presented, but I've been taking notes nonstop myself on some exciting ideas. So I'm going to just spend a minute explaining who NCBLI is and how we fit in this equation. So if we could go to the next slide, it just has our mission statement up. Um, and our mission is um, to actively promote balance and fairness in the justice system through crime victim-centered legal advocacy, education, and resource sharing. And I just wanted to put up our mission statement for a moment because we are a legal institute based at a law school that was founded to be legal representation for victims. So, so we started not from a civil legal aid perspective, but from the screening perspective of are you a victim and do you have legal needs? myriad of legal needs, of course, right? So um, we wonderfully then started to partner with others who were providing different legal services, maybe not starting from the point of a screening moment of are you a victim of crime? So we were founded almost 20 years ago, um, kind of to, in parallel with some of the other agencies that have been spoken about and shared um, already on this session. And and um, if we go to the next slide, I want to just like let everyone pause for a second. We don't have a formal poll, but I want everyone who's on the line to think for a second. How much have you already integrated into your thinking, um, like the two presenters before me, the notion that victim can be a useful screening moment to figure out legal services for folks? Just think about that for a second. And then complicate that with, how many of you in your agencies or how many of your partners actually know something about victims' rights, meaning their rights in the criminal? Many of us have focused on civil, but victims also have legal needs and legal representation needs in the criminal. So just pause for a second and reflect. Okay, next slide. And the reason I had you reflect is in every jurisdiction in this country, victims have legal rights that require legal services that manifest in criminal cases. And historically, we have wonderfully grown civil legal aid, and we have not always put that in conversation with the victim's rights that could manifest in a criminal case. And some of that was a funding histor history, but some of it was just you know, siloing, right? We started to think that criminal had to do with prosecution and defense and not necessarily paying attention to the fact that the victim was residing in that space as well. So on the screen is just a, a, an example of what rights exist that lawyers can independently activate in criminal processes or deploy in moments that are civil processes, but when um, a victim is navigating both civil and criminal. Uh, next slide. So. This idea of bringing together civil legal services, victims' rights work, victim service providers, it, and really doing it with intention and with funding came from the U.S. Department of Justice's Office for Victims of Crime um, Vision 21 project. And what this project was, was over a multi-year period, the Office for Victims of Crime embarked on a strategic planning effort that included four sub-grantees, NCDLI, my agency was one of them, but then themselves brought together stakeholders. NCDLI um, brought together a hundred different persons to give input from all across the country. Um, and then those folks brought together other groups. So it was kind of this tentacles approach to find out what did victims need. And the final report of Vision 21 included a couple of things that are relevant for today's uh, session. The first is a finding that every state will, that was a vision, right, will establish wraparound legal networks that will help ensure that crime victims' rights are enforced and that they receive the broad range of legal services needed to help rebuild their lives. So there was this finding out of a strategic plan and a vision that everyone would start having wraparound legal networks that were both rights enforcement and criminal and broad civil legal assistance. The second finding in a different chapter of the Vision 21 report was, oh gosh, how do we do this? And it was that there's tons of challenges and as the 21st century progresses, victim services field should integrate innovative technologies into their work. So next slide. So out of this was this idea of, okay, legal services and, right? Legal services and. 
And so OVC at the federal level funded two different efforts. And actually, um, Kiskeya already talked about one of the wraparound victim legal assistance networks. Um, but in 2012, the Office for Victims of Crime funded six jurisdictions to create wraparound victim legal assistance networks. And in 2014, funded four more such that there were 10, as you already heard. And then building on that, in 2017, another effort was funded out of the Office for Victims of Crime um, uh, where it was funded to NCBLI to then issue the subgrants to look at urban and rural and how do we get to the rural community and leverage technology there. So these two efforts out of the Office for Victims of Crime are two of many efforts, but that look at how do we look at civil legal assistance, rights enforcement, and start to bring together service providers, and how do we leverage technology? So I'm just going to go on to the next slide and talk just a little bit about what's being achieved in each of these. In the rural project, which is the 2017 project, three jurisdictions were funded, um, Arizona, Montana, and South Carolina. Each were funded to say, hey, how can we look to our rural communities, and each of them got to define the scope of their rural communities. How can we ensure access to legal services that includes rights enforcement and leverage technology to achieve that? And they each are, are allowing their community to decide what that technology looks like. So Arizona, it's a border moment. They're focused on the border, and it's about remote um, representation mostly for protective orders and safe passage to get to the courthouses. Montana is making more robust a website that is going to have legal information for the rural folks but not the representation component because they have found um, that deploying lawyers actually physically to locations works best so they're creating an information website and self-help tools and then deploying live persons to the rural communities. South Carolina is wonderfully working with pro bono net to make robust um, an online opportunity for their pro bono attorneys. So each of them did what we've already heard about in this session, which is a grassroots approach to what does our community actually need in terms of legal services, in terms of victim services, and then which technology would work in our jurisdiction. And that takes time to really figure it out. Um, so next slide. The Victim Legal Assistance Networks, which you already heard, I've only put six of the ten on here, but these six really spent time doing needs assessments that then resulted in technological deployments that were unique to their jurisdictions. So we already heard about New York. Um, Illinois was working on how do we use personas online to help victims see themselves in the moment so they can then decide how to navigate. Montana, we already heard about some of their, um, I already mentioned some of their um, information online. Texas made a determination that they were just going to put information online, but they were going to have a very robust inward-looking referral process. Um, uh, same with Washington, D.C. So everyone in the Victim Legal Assistance Networks project, as well as the Rural Project, took the moment to pause do either a formal or informal needs assessment of their community, bring together community partners and say, what are the victim's needs, legal and social service, and what technology will help respond to that need? And all of this really came out of Vision 21. And if we go to the next slide, I just want to flag that you can find information about these projects right on NCBLI's website. So on our website, if you go um, to ncbli.org, on the right-hand side um, are priorities, um, and under that there are um, links to each of these projects and how they are working, how they're leveraging technology, what are they doing, what are the challenges with merging traditional civil legal services with rights enforcement, right? Because we have to make sure that the funding is proper um, uh, because there are restrictions on, on pure LSC funding. So how do we do this? Um, and if we move to the next slide, what I'll say is we do it through partnership, right? NCVLI has an expertise on rights enforcement and on partnering, um, and we can go to the next slide. And our job is to help all of you that already do legal services enhance those services um, to be responsive to victims' needs. We already heard some stuff about being trauma-informed. Um, and to enhance your capacity to do the rights enforcement side of it. So if you go to the next slide, um, 
the last piece of how we internally at NCBLI are leveraging technology based on what we have learned from the VLANs and from the rural project is that we have um, a pro bono website ourselves, Mavra, and we, after learning so much from pro bono net, so much from the New York Victim Legal Assistance Network, so much from others, we reflected and have undertaken a needs assessment ourselves about what do our pro bono attorneys need and how can we leverage technology. And so we're going to partner with pro bono net to create a more robust national pro bono effort on victims' rights enforcement so that you, those of you already doing civil legal assistance don't have to become experts in victims' rights enforcement. We'll help with those. So wanted to let you know we're working on this. This is a website that right now has searchable databases of every case on victims' rights that has issued in the country since 2004. Um, victims' rights enforcement, so criminal. Um, every amicus brief filed on victims' rights by NCBLI, as well as sample pleadings in almost every jurisdiction on how would you do victims' rights work. So it's an opportunity for folks to complement their own practice through technology. Um, so um, next slide. Um, I think I just wrapped up on mine. Just super excited to be a part of this. And I want to say thank you because when I started in this work in 2003, the idea that traditional civil legal service providers providers doing um, generalized, wonderful work for folks um, with socioeconomic um, oppression happening in their lives and folks doing general, just general legal work, they did not always say, well, wait a second, what's the victim component of this? And now, wonderfully, there's this intersection that's having us say, ah, victimization results in myriad legal needs, and we as a national community can work on those together and can leverage technology to do it through innovation. So very excited by this webinar um, and very excited that Pro Bono Net and others have brought all of us together. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Liz. Great. Thank you so much, Meg. And uh, that is a, a terrific overview. And for uh, folks who may be considering attending the ITC conference that is happening in Portland in January, uh, NCVLI is based there. So you might think about that as an opportunity to, to connect in person. And then, um, Meg, do you want to just say a couple of words about the, uh, the Crime Victim Law Conference as well? Certainly. Yes. Thank you, Liz. So, um, in light of this kind of need to kind of elevate understanding of victims' legal needs, including rights enforcement, NCVLI hosts um, each, usually June, sometimes May, but next year it's June 18th and 19th here in Portland, Oregon, a national conference on crime victim law. And crime victim law is a, kind of an emerging area of law where uh, it kind of like housing law, employment law, but through the lens of victim law. So um, I, as a law professor at Lewis and Clark, have worked on nationally to get us to start to think about victim law as the umbrella term of all of the areas of law that victims have to navigate. Housing, employment, um, Title IX, victims' rights enforcement, all of that. And annually, NCBLI hosts a victim law conference where practitioners and theorists come together in Portland to talk about those areas of law, including rights enforcement, so that we can have robust toolkits as we work with survivors. So hopefully folks will join. Great. Thank you. So Terry Ross uh, from the program director from Illinois Legal Aid Online is joining us and she asked uh, a great question that I don't know the answer to, uh, which I'll, I'll pose to the group and also all of the attendees. Who, if anyone, is using text message or text messaging as a technology to help victims and how are they doing this? So off the top of my head, I'm not aware of anybody who has integrated text messaging with their uh, statewide or uh, victim services strategies that are associated um, with legal late legal aid initiatives I'll I, you know I, I do know that there are uh, some national domestic violence hotlines that have you know a phone a live chat and a text messaging component but I'll just see if any of the the panelists are aware of anything um, or if anybody on the call any of the attendees would like to chime in through the Q&A box with examples um, so a quick one I know that in uh, Washington State, we recently launched um, text messaging just generally for legal services and all of the volunteer lawyer programs, um, but it's more in response to like reminders for court dates or other things like that. Um, that's uh, We also tried a program that was um, 
following up with clients over their results, um, that was a little bit rougher. But the reminders for court dates and other things like that has been successful. Uh, but that wasn't specifically victims of crime. That was all legal services and volunteer lawyer programs. And this is Meg. I will echo that. But that many jurisdictions now they're vying, which is victim information notification efforts, or every day, um, have started to allow text for notification um, for victims. A couple of the um, sites that we have worked with, um, South Carolina being one, has started to anal and Washington DC being another, have started to analyze how can you do um, safe text with folks. And that, what I will say is, when we started to move into that realm, in addition to partnering with Pro Bono Net, we brought two other partners on board to help us think about victim privacy and safety. Um, and that was the National Network to End Domestic Violence Safety Net Project, and also the Confidentiality Institute. And we run each innovative technological moment past those guys to make sure, each of those, to make sure that as we are innovating technology, including text, we are thinking about privacy and safety. And when it comes to text, it's ensuring um, safety of the device as well as the, the message that actually happens. And generally, you can't encrypt um, text very readily, or most of us don't. And so email where you can encrypt tends to be an option we've chosen. Great. Thank you, Meg and Sart, for that context and those examples. And if any other attendees have ones they'd like to uh, share, either through the question box or on the uh, LSN tap listserv after, please do so. But uh, great, great question, Terry. So um, thank you again to Meg and Rochelle and Kiskea and uh, Sart for uh, uh, participating and, and hosting us today. Uh, we just wanted to wrap up by sharing a few resources we've touched on already. One is if you're uh, trying to get a sense of sort of the landscape of victim service providers and initiatives in your local communities, OVC's resource map is a great place to start. The Justice in Government Project in general at American University uh, that uh, Karen Lash is, is uh, spearheading and their toolkit specifically is a really wonderful resource for thinking uh, both strategically and tactically about um, uh, how to build legal aid and victim services collaborations. And then NLADA has launched a really wonderful legal aid uh, funding resource clearinghouse that is amplifying uh, various uh, RFPs from OVC and other federal funders that may be of interest to civil legal aid programs. Um, Meg talked about the Vision 21 report and strategic planning process, and there's a link to that here, along with OVC's model standards for serving victims of crime, which includes a section on uh, privacy, confidentiality, and technology. Meg highlighted the National Network to End Domestic Violence's uh, excellent tech safety net project, and the Confidentiality Institute is, is another one to, uh, uh, to keep in mind. And um, um, before we uh, uh, close out completely, I just want to acknowledge a question from Dana uh, talking about the importance of stories as an important part of these websites and how do you capture your client stories or encourage pro bono advocates to capture these stories while being sensitive to their privacy and, and trauma. Um, and uh, uh, if um, uh, uh, Rochelle um, or uh, Meg, if you have um, kind of a quick thumbnail response to that you'd like to offer just from, from your work in this area, Rochelle, the, the profiles you've done on the, the Clavic website, that, that would be great. Um, yeah, I mean, those, those stories, we, we just, uh, the ones we put on the website is we wanted to sort of exemplify common areas. They weren't really based on specific specific people, but they were definitely common fact patterns that, that did come up. I mean, the stories have been really important um, for, for the other reasons that people use stories for, just connecting with people, um, for funding, and just I think the impact of our work just really comes out through, through the stories that we tell. So this is Meg, just very quickly, um, we are moving towards encouraging on our pro bono side that rather than just doing um, like a generalized uh, client satisfaction that they do kind of um, how 
kind of client life um, life experience um, and how are you feeling and are you feeling safer um, in your life, those kind of things, and asking in those moments, um, what piece of your story would you welcome us sharing without personal identifiable information so that we are actually inviting survivors to share pieces of their experience and then we're trying to get those up. So we're inviting our pro bono attorneys to have a conversation with survivors that they've represented about what would you like to share about this experience and then and then capture that a little bit. Great. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so again, thank you to our panelists and to LSN Tap and NJP for hosting us today. And I, uh, we hope you will join the next webinar in this series, which is on developing successful legal aid private sector tech collaborations. That will be on October twenty second. And there's uh, more information online at LSN Tap. And uh, don't forget to take the the feedback survey uh, after this, and or feel free to reach out to us individually with any questions questions or additional thoughts. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation. The video for this um, should be up in a week on our YouTube channel. Um, just as a, a quick note, that contact information there, sart.row at nwjustice.org um, is missing a T, um, but it uh, that email address is being uh, monitored by NJP still at this point, um, even though I'm no longer um, with uh, LSN Tap. So please feel free to send any questions or uh, comments there. Um, and we should have some updates here in the next week or two, hopefully, um, over the uh, continuation of LSN Tap as a long term project. All right. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Sart. Have a great day, everyone.